uh, with me on stage here I have Michael Healy Ray, independent TD for Kerry since 2011. He's the chair as well of the Joint Democracy Committee on European Union Affairs and he started a month before the Brexit vote, so we can blame it partially on him. Uh, with Maureen Rail, of course, who was the CEO of Kerry County Council since 2014, before that she was at a senior level in Cork County Council, so it's not about how local government works and, and probably how the EU interacts with local government, and that has changed a lot and probably will change a lot as well. And with Dr. Mary O'Shaughnessy, who is a uh, senior lecturer at Cork University Business School, UCC, her special interests include, her research and teaching includes social entrepreneurship and rural, rural and regional development. So ideally placed tonight to talk about how that can help maybe or how the European Union interaction and that can probably make a difference for us. We're going to fire into the questions straight away and as I said we will be getting questions from the floor a little bit later on. Um, Michael, I'll start with you I suppose. Look, you, you're, as I said, Chair of the Oireachtas Committee on European Affairs. So you've probably learned a lot over the last couple of years and you came in a month before the vote so a lot of it probably was influenced by Brexit, you met delegations from other countries. The, how has that been? Can you explain how that has been for you, what you've learned and what, what that might inform people here tonight? Well, I suppose the first thing is I've learned an awful lot in that uh, we bring in witnesses uh, every week uh, into the committee and it's a joint committee, so you have both senators and, um, and TDs on, uh, as making up the, the committee. Um, very unusually for a group of politicians, I made it up one time and I think we have 272 years of experience on the committee. And uh, it isn't that any one individual is very old or anything, but the people that are there, are, are an awful lot of them are highly experienced. And it's a great committee in that uh, there's no political rivalry in it. Like there's Fianna Fáil, there's Sinn Féin, there's, uh, there's Fine Gael. And we really have a common purpose because of the problem that we have in Brexit and other issues that we really pull very well together. And I very much respect the, the members of the committee because they are, some of them are some of them are in the houses of the doctors with you know, 35 and 40 years and they have a lot of experience. And I, I really like that because we learn a lot from people like that. But every week anyway, what do we actually do? We bring in witnesses, uh, for instance, um, we meet with visiting visitor ministers and parliamentary delegations. Uh, we take part in the COSAC, the constant co conference of the European Union Affairs Committee from across Europe. And meetings are held in different countries throughout the EU on a regular basis. Um, we attend prevalent interparliamentary committee meetings held in the European Parliament and member states. But for instance, last week we did a thing that I could never get over hasn't been happening all along and to be honest it, is, but it was at my insistence that we do it. We got all our MEPs, quite the same question in the world, but it never before happened in Dali and could you imagine this? Like there was these big screens inside in the committee rooms, but they were never ever used for anything. And one day I said, like could we not use those to speak to our MEPs all together at the same time? And uh, I was told, oh yes, we could do it, but we never did it before. So we did it. And like we had uh, nine or ten MEPs, and we had, we were inside our meeting room in Dublin. They were over in Brussels, and we were able to interact and, and look at each other and engage collectively. And it was great. And I mean, in the world we're living, you'd imagine that that sort of thing happens all the time. But believe it or not, it was the first time it ever happened in Dalia. And like we should be doing that every day. And then rather than people having to get on a plane and run, people are talking about their carbon footprint. For God's sake. It just makes so much sense, you know, but things like that. But anyway, on Tuesday mornings then, and it was uh, an initiative I started myself because I see them as a very un uh, underutilized resource. Yeah. I meet with ambassadors and, uh, and their staff, and uh, a lot of them are based in Dublin. Believe it or not, we have over 100 ambassadors uh, attached to Thailand in one shape or another, which is frightening to think about it. But, um, it's good to speak to them as well and to build up a working relationship with them. So all in all, we bring people from the different sectors, uh, from from all over Europe. We're dealing an awful lot with the spokespersons on Brexit from England. Uh, we've had the, uh, the shadow spokesperson and all these from the opposition. We, you know, we bring yeah. them over. We ask them questions. 
we give them our opinion, they give us their opinion, and we try and learn a lot. And, yeah. well, and do, do you find, or have you found, aside from Brexit, <coughs> like there's a common theme of an issue that we probably don't realize here, because we're on the western edge of the continent, we see ourselves very far away maybe from Dublin, or from Berlin, or from Paris, or from Brussels, we're on the edge, so we feel about being rural Ireland, a little bit more isolated, want to be part of the decision making. Is that a common theme across your like, the, the, the problem is people are moving from the country as they get educated, or young people get educated, they move to the jobs in cities, not just in Ireland, but elsewhere. Is it, is it a common issue that European it, unions going to have to try and deal with, how it, to keep rural areas alive? It is, and it's a very major problem. Country. It's a very major problem. And in Kerry at the moment, you are the, the, the Greenway in South Kerry is a big issue here at the moment, and people are considering it, and rightly so, as a lifeline to not from rural Ireland to send uh, more people uh, down to South Kerry. And uh, if we don't have initiatives like that, uh, we will have a situation where more and more young people will say, oh, well, there's no future here for me. And that's an awful thing for young people to say, because I, I, I have no problem whatsoever with the young boy or the young girl that wants to go to Australia or America or England, but the thing is, once tough, there's no problem with that. But I hate the idea of a person saying, I have to. My uncles and my aunts in the 1950s, they left, my father's sisters and brothers, they left here. And the reason they left here was because they didn't have a fiber in their pocket. They didn't have a day's work. There, there, was nothing, there was no future for them. And they went to America. And the reason they went to America was because they would go to America or else have nothing. And I mean nothing. And they went, but unfortunately and very sadly, they never came back. Whereas other people, I, I in, in what we call the more modern times now, if they want to go to Australia, and if they want to go to America, that's lovely, that's great, that's living what you want to live. But there's an awful difference between having to or wanting to. And, and that's the, and just one thing that I showed up in, um, Radio Kerry, if Radio Kerry did a box, but to call it a box, 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 box. If they went out onto the street, in Sonia and Clam, any day, and if they said, we'll ask the first hundred people we meet, could you please do one thing for me, would you name your name, please? I can guarantee you out of a hundred people that if you would get it right, I would be able to name And I fully, so that will tell you the lack of connectivity we have with what was on in Europe, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah, yeah, no, fair enough. Um, Barbara, can you talk a little bit about, I suppose, how you've seen to your work in Cork and Kerry, how the European Union interacts with the local authority and kind of makes a difference maybe, or how much more sources it communicates over the last couple of years on, on your work in Kerry? Look, there's, I suppose, the first thing I say, there's a huge influence uh, from the European Union and global government. And I suppose, you know, maybe kind of in the 90s when the, the structural funds were there, the cohesion funds were there, and, you know, people could point to very big projects. So, you know, you could come into Kerry, I remember one time traveling around the in Kerry with European auditors, and they, they literally made a stop at each place to say, so this is where you spend the money, this is where you spend the money. So, you know, big roads, all the wastewater treatment plants down around the, the coast of Kerry, that was all true through structural funding. So people were, some of the very big projects, tourism projects that were funded by European funding, like the, the, the Mocklas Farms, uh, in Trinity, the Aqua Dome, you know, to go take the, the museum, you know, some very big um, projects right across the country had been, been funded, and LEADER was, uh, you know, not a lot of money had been pumped in, in through LEADER at that time as well. So I suppose as time has moved and as the, the funding models have changed, it's maybe less obvious um, in, in lots of ways. And I think like one of the big influences that you know people talk an awful lot about funding, and there is a lot of still European funding, and I just come to that coming into the county. But I think a huge <coughs> impact has been on the local government implementing the European directives, particularly around the environmental legislation. And Michael mentioned there, and I see Councillor Moriarty who will be very aware as well from the oral hearing at the moment on, on the South Kerry Greenway, um, is, is going on at the moment. And you'll actually see that the, the huge focus is on how are we taking account of the environmental legislation in implementing the project. It has become a, a very, very major way. You know, if you take the landfill directives, how we're you know, 20 years ago, the landfill directive came in, and you know, people thought it was bizarre that we would divert so much waste from, from landfill. Look at where we are today. Yeah. Uh, you know, you take water quality, the water framework directives. 
each and every one of those, even down to our public procurement, and you know people will say, God, look at the layers of bureaucracy in the public procurement. Would you look at it the other end? Okay, yes, it takes a long lead and time with the, you know, all the benefits of openness and better transparency with open and all the rest. So there has been a huge influence on local government in how we even set ourselves up, in, in how we interact even from a community perspective. So, you know, it has had a huge influence even outside of the funding. But today, if you look at funding, you know, we have a very strong leader program in the county. People may say, look, it's, it's not as much money as we'd like it, obviously, to be. But at the same time, we have more projects going in Kerry over 200. I see Eamon there from in the KWD, you know, uh, running in the county than in the other county uh, in Ireland. And I think that's something we should acknowledge. Uh, the local enterprise offices, uh, most of the funding in the country for local enterprise, which is support for, for small companies in the county, run through local government, it, a lot of the funding that comes through, through Europe as well. And like when you think of the impact of, the, say, like the, the local enterprise offices, that's a big one for us in Kerry because 9 out of 10 businesses are local enterprise companies. 90%, which people might realize, 90% of companies in the county actually employ less than 10 people. So having a very strong local enterprise office is very, very important for us. So say, and do you think then from that, like you said, people might realize it, do people realize no. the interaction with your two Kerry County Council, how much of a difference it's made, or maybe how much of an influence it's having on public life? Well, I suppose maybe that's kind of where I started, that maybe 20 years ago we could point at big infrastructure. People can identify big infrastructure. It's the same problem as in the government sector, you know. Sometimes people don't realize that they see the, the, the big projects. Um, but no, I, I don't think people probably do, or sometimes it might be the negative connotations that the yeah. people associate with. More regulation the, and yeah, stopping people might see this and Europe has done this, but I think when, when you do look at uh, the raft of influences that, that they have for good and positive, it, it may seem that a bit more remote, or people may not be identifying, oh, this is, this is uh, aid from Europe, or, or this is good influence from Europe. Yeah, yeah, more work might be needed in that area. Yeah. Um, Miriam, let's um, you're, you're very involved in, I suppose, entrepreneurship and, and social entrepreneurship and, and social companies. Um, what do you think from the European Union are the main approaches to fostering it in rural areas? Are, like, does it work well or does more need to be done in that area? Maybe Europe getting involved in, in creating those type of businesses in an area like Kerry to help address the rural depopulation problems that we have. Um, well, I suppose I mean, a key point to begin the conversation really is that um, you know, 25% approximately of the EU population live in rural areas. 50% of the population in Ireland live in rural areas. So, you know, we we, we are quite unique in that regard, and that we book that trend. Um, and I think that's why it's very important to have these kind of conversations um, at a regional level. Um, I think it's great that the government is in the process of formulating a new national policy for rural development. We haven't had one since 1991, and it's it's great that they've launched a national uh, policy on social enterprise development, because it, it, it refers back to a little bit what you were discussing about. Um, and of course, you know, when you look at entrepreneurship, it's on entrepreneurship as it's understood in, in very broad terms. So we're looking at individual entrepreneurship, farm-based entrepreneurship, community, female entrepreneurship, there's a lot of different approaches to entrepreneurship and I think that's very important for us to recognize that diversity in terms of sustainable rural areas going forward. Um, one of the things that perhaps maybe I'm, I'm most familiar with is looking at the area of finance um, and that's why I'd like to maybe refer to maybe just uh, issues around microfinance uh, because microfinance Ireland operates uh, with the support of European institutions and European policies. So in 2012, Microfinance Ireland was set up. Its purpose is to support the kind of small businesses that Moira has talked about in relation to those in regional um, and rural areas employing three people or less, the ones that don't get a lot of the, perhaps the headlines, yeah. but yet are making a huge impact in a small rural area. Um, and since 2012, um, and that the benefit from a European point of view is that that was created under the European um, and Social Innovation Fund. It was also part of the European Social Fund. Um, and it's a, it, it, since it began in 2012, it has approved loans of almost 80% outside of Dublin. So it's a really good indicator of where uh, this EU support for microfinance matched with some of the agencies that have been referred to. I mean, the most important um, referral 
in, into microfinance are, are in fact the local enterprise offices um, and the Irish Local Development Network. And so we see here a very good complementarity between an EU objective to support small and micro enterprises um, and linking it with local government. And, and when you talk to about social enterprises, are you talking about maybe a co-op model or is it well, let's say the, the iron sweater company from the Iron Islands exporting yeah. to all over the world? Yeah. Is it, it, it can be. I mean we we in I mean, this is the very first national social enterprise policy that Ireland has um, published. Um, and in fact, there are quite, a, it's a very large family of social enterprises when you begin to look at them across the European landscape. So you're right, Jerry. it does include cooperatives. Uh, it includes other types of not-for-profit businesses. Um, it's, it's essentially a business or, or an organization that has a very strong social, societal, or environmental mission. Um, but it has to be entrepreneurial in that it has to be trading. It has to be has to engaged in, in doing things differently, mixing up resources um, in order to sustain itself. So there has to be an entrepreneurial business side to it as well. Um, but what's unique about social enterprises is that they are really hybrid organizations. So they have a social, they have an economic objective, um, and they're very good at, at, at mobilizing resources in lots of different ways, through volunteerism, through philanthropy, through markets, and that's from, from our knowledge of the sector where we have been mapping these really since the early 1990s, that's really what explains how they exist and how they operate. And in fact, many of the elements of the new national social enterprise policy seeks to reflect that and, and not confine it to one particular type of social enterprise, but rather the, the range of organizations that can potentially exist within that label. Okay. Um, Michael, if I could talk to you, like we, we've lots to talk about, I suppose maybe sometimes the negative side of things, but you're not allowed to do by Europe or the regulations that come in. But on the, the funding size of it, and, and Maura talked there about the, the major projects that were there, at the moment it's a bit of controversy, but the National Broadband Plan has been rolled out. Uh, like I said, lots of controversy about it, but however, like the model that we have to fund it is controlled by European Union rules. You can't get involved in, in state aid, but then again, you could argue, look, this is like rural electrification. Mm -hmm. this, will, this is vital if we are to thrive and survive. It's not like the state putting money into a failing airline. So how do you see that relationship there that Ireland needs to develop it, but we need to try and interact with Europe on it as well? Well, yes, it's, it's as though we want to do it, but our hands are, one hand is tied behind our back at the same time because of the rules and regulations that are there. But... Um, one of the Oireachtas committees on, um, on communications and climate action uh, gave ages debating this. And when I say ages, I mean they talked it to death. And they came up with a set of conclusions as to where we should be going with regard to the plan, what we should do, what we shouldn't do, what we could do and what we couldn't do. And at the same time, here we are, and when I say we, I mean we politically, we are after going this way and that way and the other way, and we still haven't delivered it. And obviously this isn't a political thing sort of as such tonight that I don't want to be going down the political route of saying, oh, why this happened? Or what? So it's not a place to do that. But all I can say is it's incumbent on all of us, and when I say us, I mean politicians, to deliver a national broadband plan properly that will connect into rural Ireland in a way that whether you're in balance skellings or Black Rock, that you're a citizen of Ireland, and one of the most basic and essential things you can have at the moment, as much as you need the running water and the storage facilities in your house, you need broadband, whether it is for your education purposes, whether it is for work, for leisure, it's just a vital necessity in your home now. And it is incumbent on all politicians, all of us, whether you're in government or in opposition, to work and to ensure that that happens. And obviously, yes, oh, we are curtailed and, and uh, held in the way we can deliver it, but it has to be delivered. And uh, I know that promises were given by present and past governments and, and not delivered upon. And quite simply, that's not good enough because uh, you all know, each and every one of you know, like it's as important as the air we breathe now virtually. And uh, you couldn't imagine how we can progress and develop properly without it. Yeah. And it's its own fair. Uh, but, but, but when we say that, you, we must remember that in the area that I represent, there's an awful lot of places that we still don't have a proper mobile phone connection. There are many places that we actually don't have a proper landline connection. 
So is it any wonder then that people like me are continuously fighting for rural Ireland and saying, well, we want more and we need more and we have to have more? <coughs> Quite simply, because I think we have to be treated on the same footing. We're taxpayers the same as everybody else. And again, it doesn't matter whether you're living in a city or whether you're living in, 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 in uh, you know, down below in Gleesk and Sneem. You're entitled to the services as good as anywhere else. Okay, it might cost more to deliver it. But um, I remember a classic pay, uh, case in point. Uh, one time it would have been maybe around 1998. My late father was fighting with a particular minister about um, getting, it was a, a phone connection service that we needed for the Black Valley. And this, this was now for the landline phone. And the minister had his information ready. He was after doing up this thing that what my father wanted was going to cost 26,000 per house. And of course, the minister thought he was going to take the wind out of the sails of my father when he presented this document and he said, Jackie, how can we deliver this when it's going to cost 26,000 per house? My father cut the piece of paper, he threw it down the ground. I'll tell you how we'll deliver it, deliver it, he said. Absolutely no problem. We'll let on they're above in Dublin and that they're looking for it there, but it's actually in the Black Valley and we'll give it to them. And they did. And that's how we got the proper phone service in the Black Valley. But like, you, you, have, you have to really fight for everything you get here. And one yeah. thing that I just want to say, and it's not because Moira is here tonight, but like, I really believe that we're fortunate in Kerry in that uh, both uh, the members, the local authority members and management of Kerry County Council, they're really, I, I'm, I'm always saying this, I say it in the Dáil, I say it at every public opportunity I get. We're very fortunate with the local authority we have. You could have an argument with them about this or that or the other thing. But overall, the, like the years that I gave on Kerry County Council, I really cherished it. It was a real educational core for me. I learned an awful lot from both management and other members. And like their best interests at heart are always the people of Kerry and the development of Kerry. And like we have so much in County Kerry. And whether it is working with the leader funding that has been brought in over the years and the way that has helped small communities grow. And like 5,000 euros, and Eamon O'Reilly knows this better than anyone inside this room, 5,000 euros to a certain person or a certain project at a certain time could mean such a massive difference to, to those people. It could mean employment for years and years afterwards because it could give the person that little lift, you know, at a critical time. And uh, it's that type of incubation money that we need uh, yeah. it, you know, to get small things off the ground or sustain them or help them buy that piece of machinery or uh, you know, build that bit of a building and we've seen it back over the years, the funding that was administered through leader and all the other like the amount of different aid that comes from Europe is frightening and uh, like when something goes wrong we're, and like we're all guilty of it, we're inclined to say oh well the fellas in Europe you know, they're the cause of it all but like if we were to have not joined for instance, where would we be? And uh, my late mother used to always say it. She, she said, oh, yeah, that she had a perfect vision of what Ireland would be if we hadn't joined the EU. It would be a very romantic vision. We'd all be, like, it'd take about eight or nine hours to drive to Dublin. We'd all be going along these narrow roads, and uh, we'd have, well, we have one field now, we'd have 19 fields, and, uh, like, we'd be completely back in the 30s or the 40s. But, like... Damn it, you have to progress, you have to move on, and, uh, and I believe that we benefited greatly and, uh, by being members of the EU, and I'd be a dedicated follower of that, okay. warts and all. Yeah. Um, uh, speaking of warts and all, Moira, the, the regulation that's there, very often it could be portrayed in the media, very often by some politicians. We've seen the whole debate the last five years, really, in England. We don't need Europe. It's full of regulation. Let's free up our enterprise. Mm -hmm. We can do what we want and do trade deals and all this regulation about the size of bananas and whoever came up with that. But from your point of view, like you talked earlier about the water uh, infrastructure, the wastewater, the directives that are transposed, the standards that are set, to applying for funding. It's a pain. There's 20 pages now and there might have been one, but it guarantees money comes in. It guarantees like, less corruption, more openness, more transparency. Where do you stand now on that, that situation with regards to their onerous but maybe the standards that come from Europe between the different countries would never have been achieved or implemented unless there was a little bit of a, a push from a oh, yeah. centralised standard oh, yeah. across Europe. Look, you know, I suppose look, times move, and I suppose it's back to what they're really raising, um, insofar as, you know, you, you know, you have to progress with, with it. Um, like, I remember years ago, you know, being at a retirement and... and 
person not in this county retired said, you know, God be with the days when you could draw a line on the road and build the road. I think it was back to an earlier conversation we, we had earlier, but, you know, and here we are kind of three years later looking at the same road and sure we haven't even got to the point of the start. And, you know, that's true. I mean, I suppose the the regulation that that's required uh, to commence any big uh, project and the amount of public input, the amount of checks and balances. You know, from a local authority, you can take one view and say, God, you know, it, it's it's time, it, it takes time. You're, you're maybe dealing with the public pressure um, um, to deliver it. But by the same token, when you look and you, you look back and you say, OK, you know, on balance, you know, you take a county particularly like Kerry with all the environmental designations that we have. Do you deliver a better project that's more balanced? People have had more input. You have taken your ecology into account. You have taken your environmental factors into account. So by the time you get to the other end and you look back, you'd hope you'd have a much more sustainable project. That road would be actually much more sustainable. It might be a lot of headaches along the way. You know, I say the same about procurement, and I'll talk about procurement because people probably don't realise, but in Kerry, here in Killarney, on behalf of Kerry County Council, we run the National Shared Service um, service, procurement service for, for all the public service in two areas, minor contracts, um, uh, um, the other one's after, after which, which is terrible, but anyway. Um, so in, in these two particular areas, we, we head up for the country, the public service, uh, public procurement, so we set up the frameworks and all the rest for them. And I suppose the one thing I will say is that this has brought huge efficiencies. When we look at our areas alone, there has been millions, multi-million cost savings um, over the last number of years because of the, the whole process that, that we put into the whole public procurement. And it is a more transparent process at the end of the day. Can it be more, curb, can, can it be more difficulty for, for all involved? Perhaps it can, but again, once you start building it into your project planning, then it just becomes part of the way you do your business. And I think that's a big part of, of it. You know, that, that, uh, the, the, the regulation that comes from, from your... Once you, you get used to it, and like anything else, once it becomes part of your project, and I think once people understand it's part of the process, it's, part, it's the part of what's involved, you know, by and large, I think people are accepting in the world I live in. Yeah. Um, you know, certainly, I suppose the one thing I would say that can be difficult, it can be difficult for my own organisation, and it's sometimes the whole funding and European funding, it can be, um, it can be difficult to access in the sense of, um, it, it can be, uh, the language can be difficult sometimes, um, the, it can seem somewhat remote, and sometimes, you know, it's one thing I would very much, um, very strongly believe in Kerry County Council, we don't go for funding unless it's a project. We have a project, and either we get up through national funds, or we go through the European route. And like we've had, um, we've been very fortunate in Tralee. We had the regeneration of the site, uh, a site we inherited from Kerry Group. Um, well, it was a gift at the time, and uh, I suppose we kind of thought it was a, a gift slash headache. What are we going to do with the site? Yeah. And um, a funding opportunity came up through the ERDF. And uh, it's the, the island, regional, development, the, the, fund. The regional yeah. development fund, and the island of Geese. So we got, uh, we co-funded one and a half million from uh, the local economy, from Kerry County Council, one and a half million from the RDF, the, the, the regional development fund, which has allowed us to start the the regeneration of that site. So you know, but again, if we had. Um, you know, we've had other projects in the county. We've had a, one here around traffic alleviation in Clarney. We've had a, re a regeneration tree has gone through 40 plus million regeneration. And we've gone through the rural regeneration scheme and the urban regeneration scheme, which are national funding streams. So, like, when you have your project, like, I suppose we really don't mind where the money comes from. But, you know, in that assessment and when we're looking at the funding options, certainly on the European sense. But I suppose... And I hope I'm not taking too long here, but no, you know, we can talk yeah. about Europe and we can talk about regulation, but I suppose one of the real positive advantages I've seen in this county around our economic planning has been the whole best practice that comes from, from the learnings from Europe. And in any of the projects, and we've done um, a partnership with the, our, our colleagues in the IT Tralee who are fantastic in, at, at the whole uh, European uh, models of, of best practice, and one of the, the we, we are involved, our, our economic officer is over in Brussels at the moment um, in a, an enterprise project that we've partnered with, um, the IT Tralee is the, the lead partner. And from that, there has been a few very important models of best practice as a local government sector. We have, it has enabled us to support the, the clustering, the science and technology cluster that is here in the county. And the importance of that is that we're saying, Kerry is a place where there's a, there's a hub of companies. Uh, there are 60 companies in this. They're hoping to grow to 110 by next year. 
where um, involved in the area of science and technology. So it's really saying Kerry now is a hub for science and technology. People will be aware of the RDI hub, which Kerry County Council um, has supported, with FESCO as the private partner, Kerry County Council as the public partner, and the IT Tralee as the third level partner. That's a really big project, huge project that's underway and is under construction at the moment for, for the county. And again, it's at the high end, um, very high end of research and development and, 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 uh, and employment into the county. And we believe will be absolutely transformative in our reputation as a county. Was it comfortable for a public body entering into that? It wouldn't have been something that we would have said straight off. Yeah, do you know, partnering with, with the private body, third level, is that really a space we're in? Well, you know, again, true projects like this project, we've seen best practice right across the EU and seen where they have transformed rural, and this is rural economies, through that tripartite type of partnership. And that's yeah. what convinced us as Kerry County Council and, and the elected members of Kerry County Council that we would actually um, support it, this project. Yeah, look, that's a very good point. And Mary, I'll bring you in on that about the social enterprise and the business side of it, setting those standards or learning the best practice. Number one, it, it can get other companies outside of Europe coming in saying, look, this is a place I can do business, but also it does it get us, small as the companies may be, mm. up to a standard that if they grow to a certain size, they'll be able to compete yeah. outside their region or maybe outside their country? Yeah. I, well, I think I'll just pick up on, on Maura's point because um, at a European level and because I work in a research uh, institute as well as in, within the university, um, we've been a huge beneficiary of EU funding. Um, I think one of the projects that I'm currently uh, leading on at the moment is looking at this area of social entrepreneurship in, in structurally weak areas. So that's exactly what we're doing, Jerry. is we're, we're, we're also, because uh, a lot of the requirements of that funding is that you're adding to knowledge, but you're doing it in partnership with stakeholders. And I think that's been a, a fantastic model of research um, research uh, uh, funding and the requirements of funding because you have to explore ideas but you also have to see do those ideas work in practice and, and we only get that opportunity when we work with other stakeholders who begin to either give us a demonstration of best practice or test out the ideas and and a lot of the horizon um, funding in more recent years has been specifically at that so it's forcing people who don't normally work together um, or who, who haven't that experience actually to find partnerships. Yeah. And, and so, you know, this has been and the you big can feature. Learn, you can learn from each other. Like I, I happen to be in a, learn from each other. in a school yeah. today in uh, O'Brainon School in Kilduff and at the moment they're doing the Erasmus program. Yes. They have students from six or seven different countries and the students themselves said to me, there's Latvians, Croatians, Spanish, Greek and Italians. And they said, the Latvians are the best English speakers. And one of the students said, because they do English twice a day, every day in their primary schools. And I said to the students, said, do you do languages? No. Yeah. So you could see the difference. The yeah. Croatians weren't great. The Lat but that, like learning that for the teachers even, they can come back and say, well, maybe someday down the line, do we start doing French? Or is it, if you do it in your primary school, you're up to speed way, exactly. way quicker. Exactly. I'd like that. You can learn from uh, European partners. And, and, that and can be even, the even the point you raised about, you know, social enterprises across Europe. I mean, we learn from other partners where they have maybe established legal structures, that there is a legal entity which is called a social enterprise. Does it work? Does it develop the sector? If they wish to scale up, which is what you, you referred to, how does that work? Public procurement... Uh, how does the public procurement work in different European states um, and how, how could that influence the way we engage with public procurement if we, sh if we wish to support Win a contract these kind in Spain to provide a service. Or, Absolutely. Yeah. So that's, and, and that's a really strong directive at a European level is that these type of partnerships and this type of shared knowledge and, and uh, putting it into practice is very important. And, and the two most recent projects that I've been working on that's exactly what we do. We have partners who are universities, partners who are businesses and social enterprises on the ground. And so we, we, you know, we have a, a regular reality check as well. OK. Um, all right. With, with that, we're going to open it to the floor. It's about 7.35, so we're, we're going to spend the next 25 minutes or so getting observations or questions from the floor that we don't have all the answers up here, but we'll do our best. I'll direct it as best I can at anyone who wants to jump in here, Michael, Mary or Maura. Does anyone want to... To have a word, we have a microphone here as well. I think it's going to be passed around. So anyone want to say something at the back there? Is that Cleo? Cleo Murphy? 
Thanks very much, Jerry. Um, first of all, thanks to the Institute for having this event. I attended a similar event in Waterford maybe 18 months ago, and one of the people on the panel was the then Senator Grace O'Sullivan from the Green Party, who is now one of the MEPs who's beaming into Michael's committee room um, in, in Dublin. So I think it's a great event and it's a great opportunity to talk. I just want to say something about um, Grow Remote, because you, you've talked about social enterprise. But the number of large companies that are now allowing their employees to work from home, and if they can work from home, they can work from anywhere, and if they can work from anywhere, let's have them in Sneem and Kenmare and Valencia Island and so forth. So that is also something that's happening. I don't know if there's a way in which anything that's happening in Europe can support that or through the council support that. It is nice that Grow Remote, which is um, a voluntary organization set up last year, won a social enterprise award um, last night. So they will be doing a little bit more work than, than what they have been doing. But it is something that really would help to bring younger people back into communities. And one of the, the things I'm seeing about communities is that there's funding there for communities, but if they're not organized and if they don't have energetic people driving them forward and filling up those you know, god-awful grant application forms that take days. Um, that's what's needed. And I think there is some space for, grow, for the remote working trend to help rural Ireland in, in that respect. So I don't know if you want to address okay. that. Um, Mary, I'm going to put that to you first, and then maybe more on, on, on that idea of living and working in a rural yeah. county, yeah. no matter where your company is based. Yeah. Well, I, I think we have some great examples, like the Ludgate Hub which is, um, and also the Dingle Hub as well, which is, you know, a really good example of where you have, um, a, you know, an organisation which is, is a social enterprise, it's a not-for-profit, it's a perfect example of where you're bringing private, corporate, community, all those different assets, which, which you know, is, is a good approach for rural development, which is kind of asset-based, local place-based development, um, who come together and, and have some very, very serious business operating out of it and is, is serving to regenerate rural areas. So I think there's a lot more scope for that type of development in rural areas, and which is, concurs with you know, the, the Grow Remote um, initiative as well. Sure. And Maura, if I could ask you, a couple of years ago um, in Sneem, the enterprise community down there, they did a, a skill survey mm -hmm. of the area. Who lives here? What do they do? What skills do they have? And they found a lot of foreign speakers. And through that work, then uh, a major international company came and set up a call centre. It's still operating. Came here. Is that an example of what Cleo was talking about in terms of communities being organised, self-starting? They came up with that and yeah. look what happened as a result. Yeah, that, that's a, it's a very good example. And I think an awful lot of work has, is being done and has been done in the county to date, I suppose. The Grow Remote, it's a huge part for a rural county like ourselves. It's It's... You know, it's, it's an obvious one, you know, um, and that's why we're, we're very supportive of it, I suppose. Um, if you take the first tranche of the, sorry, I seem to be talking about funding the whole time, but of town and village renewal funding that came in, we made a definite decision as Kerry County Council, we were using it to support the development of enterprise development in our uh, villages. Um, you know, we've, we've also supported the hard infrastructure since, but um, from that... Um, we have put very significant funding into the delivery of the SNEAM hub, which is there. Um, it is up and running and people working very, very hard at this stage to, to bring about a strong activity in the SNEAM one. I was down with the Dingle one, which we, we put town and village funding into today, and there has been a whole lot of other fundings there, including Udros, have gone into the, the Dingle hub. And it's absolutely a, a hub of activity high-end activity in a rural area, to, you know, the, the, the focus and the, the pure focus is about building local resilience, um, looking at low-carbon society. At this stage, there are 30 people employed directly there. They're indirectly, there's many, many more. I think it's nearly up at 60. But again, outside of even the jobs they're supporting and the impact, and they've had a very significant impact on the NENRA, um, and the numbers going into the NENRA because of the age group of the people coming back, um, is that the, the, the capacity to build local capacity and that's what it's all about so you know again about education programs and community and talking very much about a low carbon society in a community way so it's great to see the work that that's going on there and the companies that are growing from it and um, we've co-working space in castle island which was something you know we really felt was a very um important initiative in, in castle island and then we've seen you've probably seen the report in the last week that hq Tralee has been the highest performing hub in any place in the country 
I think contributing 10 and a half million, I think yeah. it was to the local economy. Um, they, they're also in Listol HQ. So, you know, I think that mix and, and Carsevin, I shouldn't um, uh, forget Carsevin either. either um, and, and there's the, the local uh, co-working uh, hub there as well. So, and Valencia Island is, is another one that um, is, is being, um, that, that's growing at the moment in huge interest and huge buy-in and it's being led by, by Leonard Hobbs. So, like, when you see these models and how they can help a county like Kerry, and we're not alone in this, you know, we see them right up by the, the western coast, you know, they're really very good models. And when we don't have the broadband to every house, you know, they can be very important centres and places to, for people to come. But even what they were saying to me today in Dingle is that even people who can work remotely, an awful lot of people are coming in uh, and using even the hot desking facilities that are there because it allows them to, 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 to meet people, to collaborate, to, to cross... Get ideas. Uh, to get and ideas and, and yeah. I suppose, uh, physically Order to meet businesses. people as well, you, you know. So, yeah. uh, and and you're great. bringing in people with really good sets of skills yeah. that have a transferability into other areas of life as well. Yeah, okay. Uh, next question. Anyone else? This uh, man in the front here. Um, no, from Limerick. But, uh, I, I, I was just saying, like, I kind of, I'll give my own example of having bought a property in 2001 in Brough. Now, that is devalued by about 30% in 17 years. It wasn't my expectation. I thought I'd be going to be a pension fund. Now, I was in with my auctioneer, and he said, you couldn't shift anything in Brough, any of the townhouses, villages. Mm -hmm. We're 25 minutes from Limerick City. Now, I'm just wondering if that's happening in Brough, what's happening in the rest of areas that are much further out. And I would see most of the villages around me, Brough would be a kind of a town come village, but they're all sort of um, closed down. No post office, no shop, no nothing. Now, that's happening, I would imagine, around Ireland. I would actually be, my job would often take me up to the Midlands there where you'd see towns kind of with a lot of derelict sites. They're going to get more derelict. You know, they won't be improving. And so what's going to happen in rural Ireland with the towns and villages if they're not brought back to life again? Mm. And they're definitely... Now, Brough isn't the worst town. I mean, there's plenty of activity there. But as you go further and further out, I'm sure it must be difficult for other towns and villages. But I think that's a huge issue. And if the towns and villages are left out... Because it's interesting, I was in America. <laughs> and, you know, if you travel around there, you'd have a Walmart outside the town and a deserted town in the middle. Yeah. And I've seen it, witnessed it. I remember one time I walked down and there was a, <coughs> a courthouse... And there was all these beautiful shop fronts, and it was attorney at law, attorney at law, attorney at law, attorney at law. The, the, the town had been taken over by solicitors because it was a courthouse there. But anyway, so that's my point, and I think it's a bit, you know, I just think it's an important issue. Yeah, that's, look, that's, Michael, I'll address that to you. Um, that example of rough, 25 miles outside Limerick, is that an example of the lack of balanced regional planning and development we have? We've, we've a, a Dublin... And we're all talking about the problems of rural Ireland, but they've got big problems in Dublin at the moment. Yes. You can't rent anywhere. Young people are leaving, not because they can't get a job, they can't afford to find a house. Why isn't Limerick, uh, why isn't Brough feeding Limerick and being kept alive by the fact that it's that close to what should be a major city? Well, Jerry, the real stories and the real things that happen would, would explain to you how bad the situation actually is. Uh, a couple of years ago, a friend of mine, a young man, was fortunate enough to be called to the guards. He did his time, uh, passed out, and was stationed in Dublin. The minute he landed in Dublin, he was on to me, Michael, he said, if I don't get out of here, I can't afford to be a guard in Dublin. And very sadly, I did everything I could, trying to keep him cool and calm, because all I was thinking was, look, if we could just stay there for a few years, you'll go down the country eventually, and you have 30 years to do you're a young, healthy man. Please, God, you'll have a pension and you'll be out the gap. And one day he rang me and he said, Michael, that's it. I'm out of here, he said. I can't afford to be a guard in Dublin. And sure enough, he left his job in the guards and came back to Kerry and gave up his job because he couldn't afford to live in Dublin. Like, that was extremely sad. But that is what people are faced with. And as long as we keep ignoring the fact that whether it's the trellis or whether it's the, the hub and sneem are like just the fact that you can live on a lot less of a salary and a lot less of a wage in a rural area 
than what you need if you're living in the, in the Corks or the Limericks or the Dublins. And uh, so that's why when I see so much investment, uh, the other day there was 117 cranes standing above in Dublin, 117. That was more than what was standing there at the height of the boom. So Dublin is it's going to fall into the sea. There's such a weight of concentration there at the moment. And at the same time, it's so disproportionate to the rest of the country. But having said that, not to have it all be negative, I mean, Turin Cahill, the school out in Turin Cahill, uh, closed down. A local group came together a number of years ago and they said, right, we're not going to leave this building fall into the ground. And today they were celebrating, they're a finalist in a national award. And uh, they have all different types of activities going on in the school. So rural communities can fight back. But it's like the story about the, the, that city in America and where Walmart was outside and uh, the city inside was, was impoverished and falling down, that there was no investment inside that. We have places like that too. It's called Tralee, for example. Unfortunately, the centre of Tralee town is for sale. Tralee is for sale. If we had enough money and if we wanted to come in, we could buy Tralee today because every second building is for sale. And that's a shame because what we should be doing is every one of those buildings, before you look at building anything outside, it's like Kinmare, before or Kilgarvan or any of these places, before you go building or scraping one bit of green grass off the ground, you should be going along and you should be looking at all the existing buildings that are there. And whether it's overhead, you could put accommodation, family houses, whatever, businesses downstairs, small units, rental units, and you could do it at affordable money, you could buy yeah. them at affordable money. Like, we've, we've so much common sense things that, that we should be doing. Um, and it's like Cleo's point about the remote working and all of that. Of course, that, that's brilliant. But, like, we have an awful lot to offer in, in rural areas. Should, should, and should you, part of the answer be, and, and Mary will ask you maybe just jump in, anyone who wants mm -hmm. to jump in, like, the decentralisation has been talked about again. For an area like, let's say, Brough as an example, the last time it was done in all the wrong ways, yes. even though so, there were some success stories with the Legal Aid Board in Carcevine, yes. that's working well a couple of places in Wexford, doing well, but almost in spite of how badly planned it was. Now they're talking about targeting, and if you're in a government office and you don't physically have to be in Dublin, can the government move things and the private sector will, will follow? Well, and, and add it then to grow remote and communities trying to help themselves as well to regenerate places? Well, unfortunately, what happened with decentralisation, we may as well call a spade a spade, the word decentralisation, it was associated with just one political party and it, for all the wrong reasons, that it was just mm. a political, we'll call it a stroke, to win votes and to win elections, and that's what people associated. But we should get away from that now and we should... Well, if it's done right. Yes, exactly. And if it's done in and a it, proper it way. It alleviates yes. Dublin. Yes. And, and pushes some of the... Exactly. Like even, in, even since 2011, the difference, if it was nothing else but the traffic going into Dublin early in the morning now, the difference between now and, we'll say, 10 years ago, it's frightening. It's absolutely frightening. The place is, it's choky up in itself, and it's not a nice place. Yeah. Uh, I, I, to, to get into Mary, I, yeah, I think, just I for think rough and for just, small well, well, even to follow on from um, uh, the point, um, uh, the, the economic, uh, the ESRI in, um, in 2018 uh, produced a really interesting report which was looking at the imbalanced um, structure that we have in Ireland in terms of our growth um, and had projections which really said if we continue to develop with the way we're developing, then, you know, we're really running to, it's, it's an unsustainable model. So, of course, the argument is to, to move things out to the regions. And one of the interesting concepts that they introduced in that was the idea of developing second-tier cities. So, um, and, and that's coming from a lot of research that's been done by ESPON, which is kind of an observatory across Europe that looked at second-tier cities that were, weren't the, the capital city, but where investment was going into them to develop the infrastructure, to create housing opportunities, uh, you know, public sector job creation as well as private sector job creation. And they demonstrated very clearly that they were more resilient during the economic crisis. So there's a lot of evidence there in terms of developing uh, second-tier cities which can also support rural areas. So I think we have to kind of have a, a very Limerick broad could be, perspective. Limerick could be the example. One uh, of the examples Limerick, here, Cork, Cork, Cork uh, Sligo, you know, develop these in the regions so that it takes the pressure that's currently... Uh, happening at a, in, in Dublin, but also, um, you know, utilises the skill base that, that's developed in conjunction with the regions as well. So I think okay. we have to have, have a broader, I it's not just to, one solution. There's a, a man at the back there, I think, looking to speak. 
We have about 10, 12 minutes left, so... Uh, hi, my name is Adam Coleman. I'm CEO of a company called HR Locker. Um, we are a software company that are based in the Hinch in County Clare. We serve about 55 different countries, and there's 17 of us actually working in Clare. Um, what I'd like to make the point to is that <clears throat> if you look at the fantastic job that Tourism Ireland did in the, uh, uh, on the Wild Atlantic Way, if something similar was done in terms of the Wild Atlantic Way, in terms of places to work and companies, and if they were to do a, a, a program or a promo on companies that are doing well and why they're doing well along that area. There's, there's a scattered them in Kerry, in Clare, Donegal, everywhere. Um, there's lots of money being spent by the government on, on basically overseas companies being brought in, subsidies for employment, all sorts of stuff. And Enterprise Ireland, to be fair to them, are doing their best. But I think it comes to a situation, if they do want people and companies to actually relocate, be it remote working, we're also a chapter of remote working in Clare as well, by the way. Um, but if they do want them to, and they do want to change that balance, all they have to do is to put a little bit more investment in the Irish indigenous companies that are doing well. And if they at least match the money that the Googles and all these people are getting in order to actually employ people through, you'll end up creating real jobs that will stay in Ireland and will actually enrich the area. So if there was somebody who come and put together something that would sort of talk about the tech Wild Atlantic Way or the business Wild Atlantic Way, because people are moving. My workforce of 18 people basically are from all over the place. Um, most of them are either older people who are coming back into the workplace or people who can't afford jobs or can't afford houses in Dublin. Yeah. And, and they're, they're, they're quite happy to, to move if the jobs are there. But we need help, basically. Um, and not a massive amount of help, but I think more promotional help, but not in, to individual companies, but in, in but to a region or, or a place. Maura Mar yeah. put that to you. If that's something Kerry is trying to do, sell itself, Very come and live so. and work here. Um, I suppose I'd say two things about the, the Western Corridor. There's a, a government in, initiative called the um, Atlantic Economic Corridor, and it goes from uh, Donegal to, to Kerry. Um, and what it does is exactly what, what you're trying to say, is, is to take... Um, the companies that the indigenous companies and, and the non in the FDI companies right along the, the, the Wild Atlantic Way to say this is the type of activity that's happening along the Wild Atlantic Way. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's happening there is that there's a, a number of uh, hubs, as we talked about the hubs, I don't want to be all about the hubs tonight, but, um, and what it is is that they will all come under one, um, I suppose, kind of umbrella, and not that they'll all be their own separate entity, but that if somebody wants to to do something, they may be referred from one hub to the other, or if they want to, to if they're travelling along the way, you know, whatever, they, they can be referred from, from one to other, depending on the specialisations. So there's a lot of planning going on as, a, as an economic corridor. It's in place about a year. Um, there has been the, the Western Development Commission, which I suppose we're not a part of, which is a concern for me, um, has been given a, a lot of um, funding to promote and market this Atlantic Economic Corridor. So I suppose with a Kerry and a very Kerry hat on me, uh, it's very important for me that we're as much part of that marketing um, promotion as maybe Claire, who is part of it, uh, yeah. would be. So yeah. um, definitely, like I, I take the point, I think it's hugely important, and that's one of the things we, you know, we've we were we've been in constant um, discussions, we've been in constant working with the private sector around how do we raise our profile it, it, even in a Kerry context to say this is a great place to do business and I suppose that's why I talked earlier things like the cluster about uh, we've an invest in Kerry programme go going at the moment which uh, we did with, as Kerry County Council with the IDA which has been pushed out um, right, right across um, internationally and that as well so I suppose it's very important that people know that we're when you come here, you you know, we have the tourism industry and hugely important to us, hugely, hugely important to us as an industry. And that we also have the, the kind of high end um, companies. And, you know, as well, I suppose the other co thing we do, we are fortunate that we have some of our bigger companies, the likes of the, the Fescos, the JRI Americas. Um, we have the Liebers who are very, very outspoken and very much promote the county. Uh, you know, we even had... Um, mentioned the 100 embassies. We had uh, two, two embassy visits here very recently, and even the, the German 
uh, embassy were, were in Tralee recently for a signing between the German Ireland um, Chamber of Commerce and the Tralee Chamber of Commerce, and they signed a memorandum of understanding together uh, to increase trade between the, the two areas. And again, you know, I, I think to have those big companies in the county coming to that presentation and talking about the county and talking about how they can thrive and how they can, you know, grow uh, in what would be perceived to be a very rural county, um, you know, I, I think it was, you, yeah. you know, they're, they're all things that, and I take your point. The message needs to get out there maybe yeah, a bit more. Yeah, and it's very important, the message but, but, does. Does um, anyone else have a yeah. final question? Man at the back there, yeah, I'll get to a few very quickly. Yes. Uh, <coughs> Some of the going to school might have remembered this. Ill fares the land to hastening ills of prey, where wealth accumulates and men decay. Princes and lords may flourish or may fade, a Brit can make them as a Brit had made. But a proud peasantry, a country's pride, which once destroyed can never be supplied. And that's exactly what is happening here. <laughs> After that, after the Desmond Rebellion, they said you couldn't hear the call of a ploughman in Munster or the lowing of a cow. We, we got together again and we rose up from it. You come along then to the famine when everybody had four or five acres, enough to pay the landlords his, his rent based on the pig that was inside around the kitchen with them. You come along then and we got our freedom. And before that even... With Dash won the winter max, the farmers got a right to all their own farms. And we were all the time improving. And we continued to improve even when we got our independence. And I can remember, I'm from North Kerry, I can remember by Longford and Tarbot booming villages when the people, the local people, were going to the creameries, doing their shopping locally and supporting the whole structure. Now, since the EU has come in, that has all changed. And the only option seems to be industry. But what's going to happen to the people that were still prepared to stay on the land? The people that could go out there and look at 100 cattle and in one glance see what was wrong with one of them. If you ask him, how did you know? Might be the way his ear was turned. Might be the way he's holding his tail. It could be the look in his eye, but you could tell. You sent for the vet. The vet figured out the rest then for you. That sort of expertise is disappearing down the Swanee, just like the small farmers are disappearing down the Swanee. And you can talk about corporations, and you can talk about greenhouse gases or all the rest. It would be of very little importance if there were more people in rural Ireland. OK, That's thanks very much. <laughs> Michael, uh, I suppose that in the European context, that brings us to the common agricultural policy. Now, we are short on time, but just that, that policy and what it's doing to rural Ireland or where you think it should go. It's going to be heavily focused on the environment next time round. There'll be less money, uh, particularly with, with Britain being gone, to go around in terms of subsidies and payments. Is it all, yes. does it need to be changed? Well, or what's your the, view on The what? biggest challenge that we have in farming in, over the next 5, 10, 15 years is the survival of the small family farms. And when we had nothing, as this man rightly pointed out, when we had nothing in Ireland, we had small family farms. They were the backbone of our, our economy. And uh, I, I, everybody knows how passionate I am about this. I hate to see politicians forgetting where we came from. Because if you forget where we came from, you don't know where we're going. I really want to see our small family farms survive. Uh, I really see it as a big challenge. Uh, because there was one time, and it's not that awful long ago when we were growing up, if a person had 20 cows, there were, there were big operators. Now, if a person has 20 cows, you say that like, it's not sustainable as a model for a young person to, to try and make a living out of if they were going to take you over the farm. I don't, want it to, I don't want to see it being a handicap for a young person to be being handed a farm. I want them to be able to look at it and say, yes, I can make money out of this, whether it's a part-time living or a full-time living, but that they can see the positive side of it. Is it going to be part-time? Should that, oh, should it, that be it, the way Europe funds it, the model to say, we will pay you to be part-time and help you get another job as well, so you stay on the land? I'm a realist jury, and the majority of the people that I represent, for them to try and make a full-time living out of their farms at the moment is extremely difficult, and especially for the younger generation 
who, who mightn't be able to make do with as, as little maybe as their parents or their grandparents did, they are going to, ha they are going to be looking at it and saying, OK, I'm, I'm glad to have the farm at home, but I need to have this other work, whatever that other work is, to try and mix it up. To, and those to jobs will have to be local. They will have well, to be close well, to the farm. Exactly. Farms. But can I just make one point? And yeah. I, I'd love it if, if we can bring in, if, if, if we are able to bring in a couple of more questions, because the people yeah. are after, you sure. know, they want to. But just one point about regional growth. There is one idea that I have in my head that really bothers me a lot. They're talking about spending literally billions above in Dublin Airport. And at the moment, there isn't a rail track going from Dublin City out to Dublin Airport. But they're talking about spending billions out there, right? What would make a way more sense to me would be is if you took, we'll say, Shannon Airport, an airport that's an excellent facility and completely underutilized. And if you put a bullet train, we have them around the rest of Europe, why can't we have one in Ireland, connecting Shannon with Dublin? And if you had a bullet train that you could literally go from the west to, to the east in like 30 or 40 minutes, it would transform Ireland. It would make it a way more practical, like you could have people travelling to Dublin maybe to work or travelling from Dublin to, to Shannon, Shannon to, to Limerick to the west yeah. to work. It yeah. would just make such... It would okay. balance okay. us. Okay, good idea. Any, any other questions? Yes, this man here. I'll come to you next. Uh, young people leaving rural Ireland has been going on for decades. I'd like to ask the panel, are they optimistic that that can be changed? And why are they optimistic? OK, Mary, I'll ask you that first. Optimistic. Would you be optimistic <laughs> that you can keep more um, young people in rural Ireland? Well, I, you know, I, I, I'm from a rural area. I rear my family in rural areas. So, but I look at my three daughters um, and I think that, you know, they, they have a mixed view on whether they want to stay in a rural area, whether they want to go um, get employment. You know, three things that generally push us out of rural areas is either we can't get a job, we don't have a good quality of life, or we can't access services. So I think if we're going to try and address that, then we need to recognise that that's the way we have to try and meet the needs in rural areas. And there's nothing wrong with someone going away and coming back, because when you come back, you come back with different ideas, a different perspective. Um, so I think we have to be flexible about how we think we manage our youth or how we create opportunities for them to come back. And I, I think just to the speaker who was talking about, you know, grow remote and, and creating opportunities and, and promoting what, what they do, one of the conversations that I had most recently with someone who was working in, in a digital hub who was quite young, a young she'd set up her own business, um, had lived in Cork, decided to move to, to West Cork, um, to be part of this. And a question that was, was directed at her is, OK, so as you grow and as you become successful, so we have this equation that you're successful if you grow and get bigger, you know, will you then have to move your business to Dublin? And she said, no, no, I'm there for a quality of life. Success to me is actually getting better contracts and having more people come and live where we are. So I think we have to maybe have a different... Um, perspective on what constitutes growth, what constitutes success, and and then we have, then we, you know, we, we look at the opportunities, creating them for young people to stay in their rural areas. But I think we have to have a little bit of um, yeah. be open minded just, just about conscious, it. I, yeah. Yes, very briefly. I would just add one other reason why people leave. Once you get to the stage in a rural community where the vast majority of younger people are leaving, yeah. those that could stay won't be inclined to stay because they they of socialize. Course. Yeah, yeah, everyone else yeah, is gone. Yeah. yeah. So you, when you get to that stage, you can yeah. But I think people frontier. go through stages in their life as well, and maybe we have to look at that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This lady at the front here. Much just uh, sorry, the microphone. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, it's just pretty much in the sense that gentleman was talking. It's my feeling at times it still is like EU or Dublin or whoever academia bringing what rural Ireland, what remote areas should be like, and the, the feelings are very good. The thoughts are very good, and many things work. But very, very often, what is life there? What life there could thrive and thrive better? To, to go to a very, very concrete uh, aspect, schools losing teachers. It's fine for school to have three teachers in a small community. To have two teachers, it's very, very complicated. Okay, It's great for kids to have three teachers. It's much better to have a school of 45, 50 kids, Instead of one class with 50 kids, like in Dublin, where the kid is not respected, not learned to. But there's no room for that. 
And there's no room for that, and nobody really listens to that as an issue for the quality of life of young families that have young kids, that wish to stay there, that wish to offer a good education, a room where each kid is listened to. Uh, it has to do with the way its community is structured. And I think at times as well, what could people develop that it's slightly different at times from a more standard, more standardized kind of company uh, and so on. So I think to listen more uh, makes total sense. It's more democratic and it really helps European Union, Dublin to be more sharing mm. <laughs> instead of just a centre that doesn't really listen to the okay. West of Ireland. What, what about that point? And um, where I'll come <laughs> yeah. to you, like about maybe the European Union on a larger scale and the government listening better to people in rural Ireland about what they actually want? I suppose I see him and probably know a lot more now than I would about this, but I, I'll chance it. But, um, you know, I, I suppose we talked about the European Union and the leader funding and the models of leader. And, you know, I suppose a very important part of the, the, the leader, and I suppose we all became very expert in the last few years in local government because it, it's a new area for us, was that the, the whole idea of the community planning and that the strategies are driven from the people and they're, they're driven up. And I think that's one of the very um, good things that, that, have, that have really, really come from the, the whole membership of the European Union around community. And if I look at a few things, you know, that, that the, the social inclusion funding, for example, you know, like rural isolation is a big issue for us in Kerry. We know it is. We've been ageing among the most aged populations ourselves in Mayo hold, hold the prize on that, on that score. And yet if you look at the initiative like the Men's Sheds, you know, I know that people are saying there, there should be women's sheds as well and all that. But if you just take the, the, the men's sheds as they are, you're bringing an awful lot of, you know, men, older men together to do skills and to do things that, that give great benefit back to the community. I think fantastic schemes that have come from the bottom up. One of the, the requirements that, or one of the things we've been asked to do is, uh, as, as the, the lag or the, 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 the body who gives out the, the funding or looks at the funding uh, and plans for the county in relation to the leader funding has been extending that to outreach so that you go further into the rural areas for those people who can't get to the, the, the sheds, those, those men, you know, who are very, very isolated and about bringing those in. So I think that's just an example. Um, Eamon runs a, a fantastic food share uh, program again, European. Uh, I think that there's some element of the, the leader funding, European funding. Again, uh, again, you talk about it, it's a, a really strong social enterprise that that benefits everyone. And again, it's very much aimed at the um, you know the social inclusion um, part in the county. So there's an awful lot of really good initiatives. The social farming initiative that that South Kerry Development Partnership. You know, where you're bringing um, people with uh, intellectual uh, disabilities, if, if that's the correct word, um, to work in, in, a, in, 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 in farms. Um, and we've seen a huge success of this, and we've now seen UCC coming in to, to provide a qualification around that um, for the participants. And it has really been a really successful model, which has benefited everybody um, involved. And it's a model that has been, you know, being rolled out uh, across the, the county and, and ultimately, I've no doubt, the country. So again, these are very much from the bottom up and they're coming from the community up. And I think leader has been a very important one. And if you take a county like Kerry, we have a huge, strong PPN, public participation net network. We have 660 um, organisations affiliated to that. That's really, really strong. And each of those are, you know, really part of the... the community fabric and again very much part of all of that um, I suppose structure and, and the way we make decisions uh, in the county and I, yeah, I, th so I don't think that, that the, whole bottom, bottom down up. isn't necessarily. One final question, Eamon yes. Thanks very much Gerry um, look obviously the EU just come back to the overall subject, the EU has been very beneficial and you've talked about the funding the development and also I think Moira you mentioned the particip participation as well and even what we're doing today I think is really, it's really strong from Europe that everybody has a voice but we're a net contributor as a country now, so I think we have to look at it differently. And Mary mentioned that about Horizon 2020 uh, and those different projects. And I think uh, LIFE is another one that the Council have applied for and Duhalo have applied for in the past, and we're looking for one now as well. But um, what role for the EU? So I think it's, we have a fantastic panel here in relation to this. And this, the social clause, as Jerry, you mentioned, laws being transposed from Europe into Ireland. And the new social clauses that are now being transposed, they're not just around the social enterprises. I think, Mary, you might know a bit more than me about this, but it's also when 
Public sector contracts are procured, and that's why I suppose, when Moira, you're here with the uh, procurement office, uh, and Michael, you're an expert on winning public sector contracts, from what I know as well. So, <laughs> so we have a we have a good. Um, I think we have a real opportunity here to see how public sector contracts potentially can be availed of by community organisations and when people apply for them, even private sector, that they have social clauses, they understand that they have to employ people locally as well. I think it's a huge opportunity and maybe the panel might be able to respond to how we can unlock the, the potential in rural areas to avail of those public sector, yeah. sector contracts. Mary, I'll get you to come in on that one maybe, just, yeah, just on that, that side of it very quickly. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, I mean, it was, it was partially in response to the European Commission and its social business initiative that, the, that there was this, um, uh, you know, reorganisation regarding the public procurement. And, and one of the essential elements with regards to social enterprises is that they have also advocated that the contracts are, are smaller, they're broken up. So that it does allow. So it's not for, all the big companies. No, so it allows for small businesses coming in from the outside. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and in, in other countries, in terms of learning what's happening in Europe, um, in Italy, because they would have, you know, been a little bit more progressive in terms of developing social cooperatives, is that they have, you know, a particular uh, procurement policy that they have to have a profile of people who are local, who are maybe more disadvantaged, who are coming from other areas of social exclusion, um, and that they're providing services that the community needs as well. So, so we, we can learn a lot from where other countries have maybe uh, ha had more advantage in terms okay. of public procurement as well. Okay, look, unfortunately we're out of time. I hope I got as many people as I could, but uh, we'll probably have to another one of these nights maybe if the IEA want to come down again. But I want to thank everybody for coming. It was a great turnout. Uh, and thanks for, for lit giving your input and your views as well. And my thanks to our, our brilliant panel as well. You give them a round of applause, please. So thanks very much and uh, safe home to everybody. Thank you.